Welcome, everybody, to our uh, last of a three-part seminar, our uh, series of uh, webinars with Dr. Tom Deans. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we're, we're recording these every two weeks, and uh, as soon as we did the last one, I was so looking forward to this last one, to the next one. Uh, Tom, I really do enjoy our chats, and uh, today's uh, seminar comes out of the book, uh, Willing Wisdom, and uh, we're going to cover the topic of six estate ideas that successful families master. Uh, just a reminder to everybody else that uh, perhaps uh, missed uh, session number one and two. Session number one was on a book uh, that's entitled Every Family's Business, and it was about transitioning business from, uh, from generations or from uh, at the perspective of new shareholders coming into your business. And our second session was that on building smart estate plans um, as part of that, and that was from the book Willing Wisdom. As part of that, there was a challenge to us to, uh, to do the Willing Wisdom Index at the end of that session, and that's all available on our, on our website. Uh, Tom, I, I did um, complete the index, and embarrassingly, I only scored a 47. 47. So this is a memo to everybody online that having a will does not get you a score of 86. So uh, my resolve, though, is to improve my score by 25 points in 12 months. And uh, anybody that would like to go onto our website, do the, do the score, uh, do the index. It's a confidential report comes to you. Help, let us help you improve your score. And uh, I'll let you know how I make out of my journey over the next 12 months. So, Tom, I'll let you uh, just think about my score. And uh, you can kick me in the ass here in a bit. But uh, it just once again, just having a will isn't good enough. And uh, that was my big takeaway from doing that. So today's session, it's also from the book Willing Wisdom. And uh, this recording will be available on our website. It'll be available roughly 24 hours after uh, this session is complete. And uh, just a brief introduction for Dr. Uh, Deans. Um, he'll be joining us on this call today, obviously. Um, we've, we've heard Dr. Deans speak a number of times, and we love his message. Uh, Tom is a New York Times top 10 author of Every Family's Business. He sold over a million copies of the book, and the book remains the best-selling family business book of all time. Uh, Tom has delivered more than 1,000 keynote speeches in 26 countries, and uh, we'll be talking about his experience in business transition and also that of drafting wills and estate planning. Uh, you may have seen uh, Dr. Deans on CBC or BNN. So just a couple of logistical items. Uh, on your bottom left-hand corner, there's a Q&A box. We encourage you to ask questions. Uh, I do have three panelists with me today. Uh, my, my partners, uh, Richard Poole, Trevor Lukey, and Principal Darlene Wright. Uh, they will be monitoring the questions and uh, prompting me when they're gonna ask some of the questions. We're gonna get to as many of your questions as possible during this, se this session. Uh, if we don't get to them, please uh, reach out to us and we will ensure that we get some answers for you. So once again, this is all being recorded. We encourage you to pass this on to your friends and business colleagues, and uh, the more the merrier. Uh, so let's get back to today's topic, and that is the top six estate planning ideas that successful families master. So Tom, give us a little bit of idea of where we're going with this, and what are we going to talk about? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to cover a lot of ground here. Um, I'm going to give you a little uh, a little teaser. Those big six deal with um, healthcare issues, taxes, litigation, uh, the absence of communication. That's a big one. And of course, planning and governance make up the big, my favorite six. But before we begin, Bob, I got to say, you, you shouldn't beat yourself up over that 47 out of 100. I'll tell you what, that is 47 points higher than four U.S. presidents who didn't have a will and died in testing. And two of them were lawyers. So it is really hard to score, you know, in your 60s, 70s and 80s on this Willing Wisdom Index. And uh, just the fact that you, you actually did the index and were, I don't know, comfortable enough, confident enough to share your score, that is, that is more than a lot of advisors in this space. So good for you. <laughs> well, thanks, Tom. It, what, what also occurred to me when I got my report it did give me some specific items that I need to work on. 
Uh, one was that I need to update my will, but also I believe, I, I think the way that I get most uh, improvement in my score would be the communication piece. Yeah. Um, is that probably right? Yeah, it's the one that people struggle with the most. Culturally, it's the most awkward part of my recommendations. Um, and you only have to look at, the, at what's in the news. Tony uh, Shea, I don't know if you follow that news. He was the founder of Zappos, $800 million U.S. estate. He just passed away. No will. Holy smokes. Wow. Holy smokes. He, uh, he clearly did not have you doing his uh, advisory work. <laughs> uh, let's go into uh, uh, your tip number one, and that is yeah. healthcare. And I think you're talking here about healthcare, power of attorney, and uh, maybe blend in with that some of the new COVID concerns. And life has just changed a lot in the last six months here. It, it really has. I mean, I, I, I've been kidding by saying that estate planning was priority 172 for most Canadians, like really low on people's priority list before the pandemic. And and of course, this thing unfolds and then you have, you know, I mean, you really had people really genuinely concerned in an urgent way about whether or not their parents had a will, power of attorney and healthcare directive. Um, because it was, you know, the, the, quite frankly, the media was starting to cover what was happening to, um, you know, seniors or anyone else on a ventilator, family members arriving at the hospital completely incapable of advocating for their parents because they didn't have these documents in place. So this thing finally, estate planning has finally made it to the top three things that are keeping people awake at night as well it should. It should have been all along, but now there's an extra urgency. So, so where do I keep this document um, would be one question I've got. I've also got this question about, I, I do hear healthcare professionals, they do comment on what should be in here. Where do I get the best advice about how do I actually even start drafting this? Is my lawyer the one that really understands this stuff or should I also include my doctor or other healthcare professionals? Yeah, you, you absolutely, you know, I mean, it's like anything else, you should, uh, you should really look for a lawyer where you feel there's a good fit. And any, any, I think any lawyer who's practicing in this area is really practicing full time in this area. In other words, they're not doing, they're not doing real estate transactions at nine you know, um, divorce at 11, and then they get to wills in the afternoon. I mean, the kinds of lawyers that really know how to draft these advanced healthcare directives are, you know, those are the documents that are dealing with resuscitate, do not resuscitate. They do this all day long and they follow the changes in the law. And there is a lot of case law every year in every jurisdiction. So the laws in Alberta are very different than BC and Ontario. So you just, you need really to do your homework, your due diligence, um, I know people can, you know, talk to you and you probably have your own ideas on where you can direct your clients or people who want to work with you. Um, but it's really important that you, you get someone who knows what they're doing. This is not a do-it-yourself project like renovating your basement. This, you, you just, you can really mess things up. So, you, um, and then when you have that document, you can also share it with your family doctor. Um, chances are, that your family doctor has got privileges in the hospital in which you find yourself in your last days or your parent does. And it's, I can't underscore how helpful it is for a doctor who says to the surgeon or someone else, I know exactly what to do. We've had these numerous discussions. I have the document, we know how to proceed. Compare and contrast that to a family who's had no conversations, no documents in place. There are four children in the hallway of a hospital trying to deliberate on whether or not they should resuscitate heroic measures, even though they're hearing words like vegetative state or irreversible brain damage, the, 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 the kids are bickering in the hallway. Meanwhile, a parent is languishing and, and their best interests aren't really being acted on. So listen, if you wanna give yourself a great gift and, and your family, this is, this is a great place to start. You're, you're, you go in for the will, you come out with those two other additional documents, the financial power of attorney, and the healthcare directive. Tom, how often do you deal with your healthcare directive compared to your will? Do you review this as often or give us some tips on how often I should look at this? Yeah, well, in our family meeting, which is annual, we obviously we're, we're sharing all of our documents and reviewing them prior to that meeting. And if there's any material change, um, based on the previous year's conversations in the family meeting, and, we, and we, that leads us to update our will. Maybe we have a beneficiary 
who dies, or maybe we have a new someone born. Like there's lots of reasons, or we start a business or we sell a business. Something material changes in our lives. We're updating not just our will, but all of our documentation to reflect our current circumstances. Uh, I, you know, Bob, I hear it all the time. You should update your will, power of attorney, healthcare directive every five years. I, I do not know what is magical about five years. One year, every year. And you, and you alluded to the fact that, you know, when you get these documents done, you should get a copy. Um, some people like bringing the original home and storing it either in a safety deposit box, in which case they're sharing the key or the password with their executor so they can access that document, need be. There's no sense having a power of attorney, for example, or a healthcare directive and not putting it, that document into the hands of the person who has been pre-authorized to act in your, right? Scavenger hunts in the middle of crises do not serve families particularly well. Oh, I can understand that. And if you're on the on the uh, the gurney going to the hospital, you're really not really thinking about where that document might be, or to answer the questions. So, now, what you should be thinking is, I have got to be the smartest guy on a gurney right now and anywhere in the world because I had the foresight to imagine that the end comes to all of us. And I knew that and I empowered and organized my affairs so that people could advocate on, on my behalf. I'm a smart guy. That's, that's what I wanna be thinking about when I'm on the gurney. <clears throat> Seems to me in your book, you did have a quote that says, um, you're either, you're, you're never ever uh, on time for your death. You're, you're either early or late. It's just, it's never, you're never possible to plan this exactly right. Yeah, there's a lot of people who think, uh, you know what, I'm selling my business here, uh, this year, so I'll do my will afterwards. Or, you know what, I'm super busy right now. I think I'll do it next month. Next month will definitely be better. It'll be after, after Christmas, the holidays will be over. January is a great time to do it. Well, you know, January comes. There's a thousand reasons why we procrastinate and kick the can down the road. <laughs> um, but the reality is you're not on time. There's no such thing as being on time with your estate plan. You're early or you're late, and it is a conscious decision. And so when we decide that we wanna be early with our estate plan, then, we, then the, strong, the strong call to action from today's webinar is today, this afternoon, not tomorrow, today, I am going to reach out to Bob and find the name of a, of a good uh, lawyer who can help me, or I have one, and I'm gonna make that call today and set an appointment. So, Listen, it's not like an oil change where you schedule it a month or you know, a week later. This, we just don't know. Uh, the guy that I just referenced, Tony, Tony Shea, worth 800 million, who just passed away, the founder of Zappos. He was 46 years old. Did he think that he was gonna die at 46? No. no. Um, and now, he's, now his family is full of confusion, shame, public shame. This is how his... This is how he's leading the headlines. It's not, he built this amazing company. He was incredible uh, individual entrepreneur. He's remembered for being like completely disorganized. Like that's not who he was in total, but that's the last headline. Right, right. I'm gonna let one of my panelists uh, jump in. I think Richard, do you have a comment? I do, yes. Uh, Tom, thanks again for joining us. Um, so we talk about these personal directives, you know, the will, the power of attorney. Um, what are your thoughts on, thoughts on who those representatives should be? Do you generally see, you know, the executor is the same person who's the, as the power of attorney, who's your, your, uh, your personal directive representative? Is it always the same person or should different people be chosen to fulfill those roles? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, my, my thoughts on that are, are, um, are, the, are the same as the selection of an executor. I mean, people say all the time, they ask me all the time, should I, I have got three kids, should I select one, two, or three? Odd numbers, even numbers. And my answer is always the same. I don't know. The answer is in the room. I'm not there. You should assemble the people who will be impacted by that event, typically your beneficiaries, your family members, your children, your parents, and get them together and say, look, let's play this game called what if. What if I bump my head? I'm unconscious. It's not looking good. Who, who should be my power of attorney? Who can, you know, weigh in and make decisions on my behalf? Should it be all of you, one of you? I, get, I guarantee the answer is in the room. The advisor doesn't have it, they don't know. And I just think it just, it's just, it is such 
a great gift to your family, a non-financial gift to your family when you give them the document, the clarity, the pathway, the permission, oh, and the transparency to, to, to really, really fulfill that function in a really honorable way. What a great gift. And as I said, compare that with the family that is bickering in the hallway. Uh, it, it, and it's happening right now in Edmonton. Right now, there is a family in complete chaos and turmoil because they're not doing the kinds of things we're talking about. Tom, we're gonna to move on to our next point, but just, I, I believe question seven in the book addresses all of the, uh, your last wishes. So, you know, we're talking about the healthcare directive. That's one piece, but the other piece about, you know, how, how other things will unfold as you, as you pass on, that's probably also part of this and takes a lot of the confusion out of uh, the future discussions or the hallway discussions. So I'm gonna, uh, but we're, we, we need to move on. So let's, uh, let's park that for a second. Number two item that families master is that of taxation. Now this one's kind of neat because uh, that's what we do at HLH. We love tax planning. Um, tell us a little bit about what successful families do in terms of avoiding tax and what, what are the things that you see? I'll tell you what really successful dynastic families do, and, you'll, and you seldom read about it, and it has nothing to do with the tax code. You know what they do? They share the same advisor. My, my, my accounting firm is my parents' accounting firm, is our kids' accounting firm. Do you know the kind of work that they can do when they're meeting with, and they know the whole intergenerational story? Do you know the kind of options, planning options, that are available to that accountant? right? Compared to, I don't know who your children are. They don't want to talk to me. All I can do is represent you and have, I have this singular kind of one generational view of tax planning, make it, I don't know, make some money, but no consideration for the, for the transition of that wealth. So really as it's nothing specific to the tax code, but it really is about family meetings and, and sharing advisors and the advisor understanding the family intimately. Who are they? Do they have special needs? Is there special is there disabilities in the family that require a trust? Um, and, and ditto, wow, watch the benefits multiply when not only is the accountant sharing the same family members across the generations, but the wealth advisor and the lawyer, same thing. My lawyer, my parents' lawyer, our kids' lawyer. Wealth advisor, same thing. So when we're having a family meeting and, those, and there's that continuity of advice all in the same room at the same time, oh my, it's so easy. If it wasn't so easy, it wouldn't be so sad that more people don't do it. It's so easy. It makes life and all of this stuff, which feels so complex and overwhelming, it makes it so easy. You know, I think of some of the, uh, the, some of the tax code that we do use, and, and that is of taking equity and saying, let's free some of that equity. Let's move the future growth to the next generation. That is a topic that could easily come up and should come up within an entire family so that you know, some of this uh, moving the, the equity onwards, uh, it's a great way to have uh, the next generation understand what's happening, why it's happening, and the dollar amounts that are involved, as well as, you know, what kind of dollar amounts do we have to save for the, uh, the tax man, uh, given our current situation? Yeah, and, and really important, again, without getting too granular on the tax um, options, but clearly one of the benefits of a living gift from parents to adult children is the opportunity. And you'll know from my book that I'm a huge proponent of, of living gifts because they're tax free um, from one generation to the next, but it more, more to the point is it really gives parents an opportunity, not just to write the check and transition some wealth, but actually to have conversations about what that wealth could be deployed for, whether it's being saved and invested to fund their children's retirement or education or starting a business or healthcare. But when it's, it's not just the writing of the check, that's easy. It's the family meeting and the coaching and the mentoring and the, and the, the expression of the hopes and aspirations of the senior generation for that next generation to be really, I don't know, emboldened by those gifts. And that is what family and wealth is all about, right? As, as opposed to, Someone aging, amassing wealth, hiding it, keeping it secret from the next generation, and then dying, and, and then it's a surprise. 
and, and not being able to enjoy watching your hard-earned wealth release potential in the next generation. I mean, I, it, I don't know. I don't know about you, Bob, but occasionally I buy my wife a birthday present and I actually get it right. And it's, I mean, it's great. It's like, it's really great to watch someone light up when you exceeded their expectations. And it's, it's not just what they want. It's, it's a combination of what they want and what they need. And I just think estate planning is much the same way. When we can contemplate these living gifts with our, with our children <clears throat> and get that part right, and it gives us a little glimpse of what they'll do when they get the big prize, when they get the bulk of your estate. I, I just think that's smart family planning. Great. You know, I, I, I can't help but think that um, we just have to remember that all this COVID spending that our government is, is doing, it has to come from somewhere. So I really don't want it necessarily to come from our estates. And uh, just as recently as on December the 4th, our federal finance minister made a very strong hint that family wealth was maybe the one good place to look for a pool of money that would kickstart the economy when, we're, when we get going again. You know, uh, those are signals that uh, we better uh, not, not forget about this stuff. And uh, let's start working with today's rules, what we know today, and uh, make some strong plans going forward. I'm going to move to uh, number three, because otherwise uh, I always find myself, you know, wondering, do I have enough material? I know we're going to run out of time here. So number three, um, I think that's the one about estate litigation. Um, maybe give me a couple of examples of some litigation uh, situation that you found and uh, how could we avoid some of that litigation? I think something really problematic right now is um, the elderly people who are finding themselves receiving care uh, from one of their children and then doing what often happens is they, they will want to compensate that person, that child, and they do it through their estate plan. So they alter their will late in life, leaving more um, to a son or daughter. And no, this is not based on a full discussion in a family meeting. It's, it's that's what they do. Then they die. And then the will is read. <laughs> and, and the kids who weren't providing the care lose their mind. Uh, they're shortly after losing their mind, because remember, they're grieving. And now they're grieving and they're angry. Then they hire a lawyer and they sue their brother because they figured, or sister, they figured that the caregiver child uh, had exercised undue influence over their parent and held, held their hand and changed the will late in life. That's incredibly common. Uh, and then right behind that is uh, parents who are looking at someone elderly, looking at their own children and saying, my goodness, they've done very well for themselves. They go to Jamaica uh, more than we ever did, lots of vacations, they have beautiful cars, nice home, everything's, I mean, they've got so much. And they equate estate planning with need. So what they do is um, they skip over their own children and they, and they go to their grandchildren and leave their estate to them. And then, you have, and then of course they die. And then the kids often um, have a, a significant amount of money left carelessly so that when they turn 18, uh, they get it all. And then they, you know, then it really undermines the, 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 the second and third generation relationship, really destroys it. Uh, so you're, you're often ending up with litigation uh, there. You're off, uh, and one of the fastest growing areas of the litigation, if you can believe this, Bob, is people leaving the vast majority of their estate to charity and then children losing their mind and they sue the charity. So how do you fix this? Look, what's, what's the fix, Tom? I'm going to keep on coming back to my favorite. It's that family meeting with advisors present. It's that family meeting where, where families uh, strip away the secrecy and they have full and open conversations. Um, and and those, those estate plans and those decisions that are, that are discussed and built in a collaborative way, first of all, they very seldom end up in litigation because other family members go, listen, we all heard the same thing at the same time. We understand. We may not be happy with the decision that mom and dad have made with their estate plan, but listen, we under, we, we heard the logic and we all heard the same thing at the same time. That's very different from uh, Charity X lobbied mom and dad when they lacked capacity, they got themselves written into the will and they took the majority of their wealth. That's a very, can you imagine um, someone who is aggrieved by what they receive as a beneficiary in a will, or maybe they're completely disinherited and they appear before a judge and 
other family members go, well, listen, my, my, my mother and father, with their advisors present, had 15 consecutive annual family meetings in which there were minutes taken. And this was their decision. And they were consistent and deliberate for so many years. I mean, these are, these are really, what I'm describing is something that is really impenetrable. They're really durable estate plans that are not subject to, to flippant litigation. Right. I'm going to invite one of my panelists, uh, Trevor Lukey. I believe you have a comment. Hi, Tom. Um, this is great so far, by the way. Thank you for this. This is unreal. Um, I wanted to ask you, though, we're talking about all of this current planning and whatnot, but in Willing Wisdom, the thing that kind of struck me is that your first two questions really have to do with looking backwards, really, into the past. And I'm just curious as to why you feel that that's such an important part of planning for the future. So could you just expand on that a bit? Yeah, I think, I think everyone wants to jump much too soon into, um, I think, into the granular detail, the tax planning, the, the, the legal structures. And, and I think when we really understand that by painting the picture and connecting the next generation to our family stories, um, we, we really frame our wealth in a very personal way. Studies have shown that we're eating fewer and fewer meals together as families. Family meals, gatherings, were the place where we not only told uh, daily stories, but the story of the family that reached back generation and generations, two, three, four generations. And we're just, we've stopped doing that. And the consequences are, are transcend financial. They, they really have undermined the very institution of family. And I think part of what I'm trying to do is resurrect that, trying to resurrect this idea that it is the connection to the family stories. And I don't mean family stories that are just, hey, your grandfather started a business 75 years ago and he was amazing and he never made a, made a mistake and he was just the best. It's actually, I have been in family meetings as a, as a speaking resource where in fact, and I'm going to use these words very carefully, the matriarch and patriarch, two words that are often, I don't know, they feel ancient, but these matriarchs and patriarchs, I'll come back and explain why I'm using those words. They were making themselves very tiny in these meetings and they were the holders of the, of the family stories and, and they were sharing not just what was fantastic about what they did and accomplished, but actually putting an emphasis on where they pulled up short, that some of the regrets that they had, some of the mistakes. And, and from a place of gratitude, they're saying, I don't want you to make the same mistake. I, I want you to learn from my wisdom, both the good, the bad, and the indifferent. And that is what makes up these family meetings. And so that is the role of a patriarch. There was a time. And I kind of can connect with this. I'm 58 years old and I remember, oh my gosh, I remember inter interrupting my grandfather and I remember being scolded. He was telling a story and I thought maybe it was boring or something. I didn't have the patience. And I remember being scolded. I, re I remember someone saying, listen, zip it. There was a time when, when elders, even that word feels old, when they spoke, you listened. There was a hard earned wisdom. And you could see it in their wrinkles in their eyes and the face, and it was just a grit to them. And now that, I don't know, I feel like that has changed. I feel like now if you're old and you're, and you're not earning new wealth and, and you're employed, you're kind of kicked to the curb and you're, I don't know, you're warehoused and, and family connectivity and story has been diminished. And I think that's really what drives me is to really resurrect that role of that ancient wisdom that's alive in every family and, and how we can benefit from that wisdom. And I think probably now more than ever. You know, I, I think there are some cultures where when the elders speak, um, you're not allowed to necessarily say anything until they, after uh, perhaps an extended pause, say thank you and they give the floor to the next generation. And that it behooves us to uh, think about some of those things and have some of those meaningful conversations. You know, the, the other way of, of looking at this is you, you could just say, well, you know, I don't want to have these conversations. I'm just going to put my head in the sand. Uh, they'll figure it out. They're smart enough. Um, the, the logic will prevail. 
and it, it's it's their problem. Um, I, I'm not going to deal with this. And I know there's some quotes, some favorite quotes uh, of, of, from you in, in the book that deals with that. And that's not really what passing on wisdom is all about, is it? No, it's not. In fact, there is an academic, an area of academic study called family systems theory that talks about how families repeat. And so there may be people listening in today whose parents had modest wealth, right? And they just, they just didn't, there was no emphasis placed on estate planning or family meetings. And so really what I'm saying is, if you have accumulated wealth, we really have duty, a duty to ourselves and to our family. I mean, wealth, wealth is not just necessarily an opportunity. It can really cause serious damage and pain to the recipient when it's transitioned carelessly. Or, or even, even worse, transition with great indifference. Right. I do want to pick up one comment because I'm going to forget it otherwise, perhaps. Uh, you mentioned that, that skipping a generation is usually never a good idea unless you really want to buy, make a bunch of lawyers happy and the litigation starts. Is there ever a situation that, you've, that you can think of where you skip a generation and you go straight to the grandkids? I, 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 uh, I've seen the money go straight to the grandkids grandchildren through their parents immediately based on a based on a family conversation but it is that deep respect by the senior generation who says you know your children best uh, and and it's why you know in the willing wisdom index and in the book i talk about and i ask the question when i have when i name a beneficiary I want to know that my beneficiaries have wills. I want to see how my wealth and wisdom will transition through my beneficiaries. Like, what is their giving intentions? And when we have that bigger, longer view of wealth, that is so exciting for a family to explore how a dollar earned and saved and transitioned will impact a, a, a family one of our family members, two or three generations down the road, whether it's through their philanthropy or their starting a new business, it, this, is, this should be fun. I mean, I know it's a little bit of a stretch thing. I want to put the fun back in funeral, but I seriously do believe that estate planning does not have to be this sad thing. It actually can be the thing that helps the fear about aging and dying recede because we're asking our family members to join us in that conversation and to hold our hands when we near the end and use our wealth to deepen those relationships. Right, right. I'm going to move on to uh, the, the item number four in your book, and, and it's about uh, the, the your will is always, uh, you made the statement that my will is always done in collaboration with my family. And and your your point of view is that silence is a destroyer of family wealth and, and family relationships. So how do you get over that? What do, what do you do? I think we've talked about this before, but talk to me a little bit more about that communication piece and the family meetings, et cetera. Yeah, and it really comes back again, again and again and again, back to the family meeting, where we, where we start the family meeting, our family meetings. First of all, we talk about the importance at the very beginning of our family me meeting about the importance of communication and confidentiality. And, we, and it's, a, it's a great way to reminding people, especially younger members of our family, that what they're attending is pretty special. And it's not for public consumption. We're dealing with personal family issues. And, and with our advisors present, it kind of creates this professionalization of the family. And I just think that, and it's happening, right? It's just that no one wants to read about the family that meets regularly, has structure, minutes, decency, respect, trust, because they've worked on all of those things and they've found a way to talk about money and, and not to treat wealth as if it's some kind of a thing to disparage or to, or to fear, right? I mean, think of the mixed signaling that we send our kids. You need to get a summer job when you're young. You need to save for your tuition. You need to get a good education, work hard so that you can make lots of money. And if you're successful, then you can keep it secret because, man, you don't want to talk about money. It's bad. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? I don't get that. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, in these family meetings, and, and 
I know that you've described in a previous session that at some point, ideally, the estate value has a certain amount of liquidity and, and it could provide some of the family members to buy other assets, those kinds of things. Realistically though, not everything is liquid and not every asset that you own is easy to divide. So let's say that I have a corporation. I've got two daughters. One daughter maybe is involved in the business and the other is not. And I, I didn't sell the business. It, it, I passed away before the business is sold. A lot of those things are just tough things to talk about and, and to and decide how to deal with. Or land equity. If, if I was a farmer and, and I paid for a bunch of land and, and, and I didn't necessarily sell the land because I'm thinking, well, maybe someday somebody would like to use this land. Those are the kinds of things that you also talk about in these meetings. And, and to what level of discussion do you get, Tom? Well, we get very granular, particularly as we get, uh, you know, more used to meetings. Um, and we deal with those, with those hard to divide assets first. And so we, we have a well-worn strategy that as we are aging, we try to actually sell those hard to divide assets. Very difficult to to divide a two bedroom cottage among four children and six grandchildren. Uh, very difficult to divide a family business where you have stored and hoarded the vast majority of your personal net worth and the retained earnings of that business. And you have one child in that business and one outside or three outside. I mean, how are you, is fair equal or is equal fair? I mean, how are you going to, how are you going to create a situation where those kids outside or outside the business are not gonna feel aggrieved. I mean, uh, or even worse, a business owner who dies intestate and then the shares end up through the laws of intestacy, thrusting all of the children together in business together and only one has got knowledge of that business and feels like they've created the value through their sweat equity. It sounds to me like you've I mean, just inherited a whole pile of debtors and, and uh, other bankers that uh, you've got to make happy at some point. It's, it sounds like not a very pleasant situation. Yeah, and, and it's all avoidable. So the good news is it's 100% avoidable and it really doesn't take that much work. I, I think I referred early on in, in the session to this idea of playing that game, what if? What if I die? What if your mother dies first? What if, hey, nothing says we die in order. What if? Our children die. How are we going to divide the estate? Is it going to flow through their family? It, or will it be, will their portion be divided among existing first-tier beneficiaries? Like there's lots to talk about. And it is, it is the silence around this issue, which is interrupting and creating roadblocks for really healthy relationships between siblings today. There can be, I know, there'll be some people listening today who are who have very great, I mean, successful businesses. They've had a great relationship with all of their individual kids, but they, they but the children aren't close, and they're they're scratching their head, going, "We're we are so fortunate. We have so much gratitude. But we cannot figure out why the kids are not getting along." It's because everyone knows that the family wealth is in the business, and the founder has left the question of how that equity, the value, the wealth will transition. So the kids outside the business are just assuming that the one in the business is going to get the lion's share. That could be the furthest thing that mom and dad are thinking about, but that's the assumption. And so you gather and no one's feeling, no one's feeling particularly good about the future. Yeah. I'm going when, to ask that. Go ahead. Well, I'm just going to say when we have the family meetings and we break the ice and we say, look, uh, instead of us telling you how it's going to be divided, let's have an open conversation. Let's design something and, and then and bring the clarity and the predictability so everyone feels good about this so that you guys can have a great relationship and get on with, 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 with your productive lives, knowing that everyone will be treated either equally or fairly, but there will be no surprises. Right. I'm going to ask uh, Darlene to jump in. I think she has a question. Hi, Tom. Um, yeah, I do have a question. Um, so, you know, the, the importance of these family meetings is very apparent. Um, family dynamics are crazy. And it's funny, I have some, uh, some clients who watched the first two sessions that we had and wow, intellectually, this makes sense. This family meeting is the right thing to do. But there's no way, there's absolutely no way. 
no matter how much it makes sense, it just doesn't, it's just not something that they can wrap their head around doing. So how do say I as an advisor or just as a friend, get them past that? Like is maybe the first family meeting something that should be facilitated? Or how do you how do you push how do you push these people past that? Okay, that is a really, really great question. And here's what I would say. We all know that either as investors or as business owners, we we have made money by taking risks, but not outlandish, crazy risks, by taking measured risks. We know that there is very seldom reward without risks. And all I'm saying is, this is, this is a risk worth taking. As much as it feels awkward and difficult, which it probably does because you've never done it before, once you have one family meeting and with your advisors present, understand that the family meeting will be profoundly different than the family with your advisors present compared to the one where you're, you're meeting just with your family. It will devolve into emotion. And a lot of people will, will bring their own fear of aging and death and, and will un, 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 kind of take those conversations off, off the track. With advisors present, with advisors as skilled as you are, who can say, look, we can do this. You've made wealth. We want to help you protect it and transition it. And if we can talk about this and start small, just with mom and dad and the kids, and we can expand this out to include the spouses later, but we're not gonna let perfection or the so-called perfect family get in the way of, of an imperfect family meeting. It's okay. It will, the next one will be a little bit better and then a little bit better and a little bit better. And then at some point, and I, it's different for every family, at some point, it becomes the day that people really look forward to because there's very little granular or technical or tax or legal stuff that's being discussed. It's the family that is gathering to celebrate their, their good fortune. And it's a family that is celebrating how hard they've worked to function well together. It is, listen, it's happening. Families are doing this. We're just not reading about it and probably never will because who wants to read that story? It feels boastful. What are we reading instead? What populates the headlines? The families that are fighting, the litigation. And we're left with that, that, that narrative. Shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in thir- three generations. Make it, maintain it, blow it up. That's the way it's always been. That's the way it'll be. Throw up our hands. Don't even try. I, I, we can do better. We all can do this. I love it, Tom. I totally agree. And, and it's a, just a matter of uh, buckling down and uh, taking that, that discomfort piece and moving one step further. You know, I, I was uh, wondering, uh, planning, uh, number five in your list is that of planning. But just to go back and, and transition between these two, I was trying to figure out whether it's more fun to grow the estate value or to uh, figure out uh, the question on how do you now, now what, how do I deal with this value? Um, sometimes the, the now what piece of this isn't as fun. When we're growing it, we've got all these ideas, we're growing, building our business, we're doing all these things, and we're almost too busy to worry about anything else. Now that you're dealing with the now what piece, like what am I going to do with this other piece? This is actually, frankly, a bit more challenging than the growing of the equity piece. So tell me about planning and, and uh, how do I transition my mind to figuring out how to do the now what piece and make it fun. It is, it is very much, I think that's a very accurate statement. I mean, it is fun creating wealth. It's fun trying new things. If you're a business owner, launching new products, hiring new people, expanding your, whatever it is, it's fun to create new wealth. Uh, because really what we're doing is we're exercising control. That's why we're in business. We like to actually, actually, it is the pursuit of control that is more intoxicating than making more money, right? Like more money for someone who's got more money than they can already spend, want to spend, feel good about spending. If that's not what they're chasing, they love creating. 
They love being in control. So along comes estate planning, where we're talking about aging and losing control and losing bodily functions and relying on our family to provide care for us. You can see how, how difficult it is for someone who logically knows that control has been at the center of all things great in their life. And then this thing comes along and it asks, and I'm asking you to do what feels like it's impossible. But do you know, Bob, the greatest expression of control is the relinqu voluntarily relinquishing it before someone forces you to do that. Now that is wisdom. That is my definition of wisdom. No one can force you to write a will. No one can force you to transition some of your wealth to your heirs and coach them and teach them about investing and saving or starting their own businesses that they're, that they're passionate about. That takes great introspection. That is not easy. But when that happens, that is way more fun than making more money that you don't even need. So, so I know that the premise of your book as well is that it's just not about money, passing money from generation to generation. It's a passing wisdom. So Tom, I'm going to put you on the spot. What are the one or two pieces of wisdom that you're passing on to your next generation? I'm going to give you one or two of mine too. Yeah, I've, I've, well, in our family meetings, we spend a lot of our time. One of my favorite questions of the seven questions in Willing Wisdom is we ask our, our, uh, our children uh, who share the same advisors or advisors are present. You know, we say every year. So this year, based on the year that has just unfolded, how would you deploy an inheritance? Our kids are both bright kids, both Western University graduates, one in business. Another one is doing great work as a, uh, as, as a registered nurse at Sick Kids. It's, these are bright kids. It still took them about 21, 22 years before they said, we can't really answer that question until you tell us how much money you're, we're going to inherit. We're like, because we weren't going to, we weren't going to disclose until they said, like, if you really want me to answer that question, what are we talking here? So we knew they were ready when they had that moment, that, that, that own kind of epiphany. And we disclosed, we disclosed. And I can tell you, they did not head to the couch and start playing Xbox for the rest of their life. They're, these are hardworking kids who understand what is coming their way. Now, we don't know when it's coming their way because bad things happen. I know two couples that both perished at the same time. Friends, like we don't know, but I do know that they are ready if that happens. They are prepared and ready. And I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that they would go on to take that inherited wealth and do great things. So part of that, those decisions really came from me passing on, I think a central idea, which is, uh, but we're, you gotta understand we're competitive. We're competitive in sports, we're competitive in life, we're competitive in business. And there, I've watched three generations of our family try to leave more than the previous generation. It is not about consuming more. We are, we are profoundly driven to create more opportunity for the people who matter most in our lives. That's, that's fantastic. I will let uh, Trevor uh, jump in. I believe, uh, Trevor, you have a question. Yeah, absolutely. I was just, on this planning piece, I was just wondering, you talk a bit about transitioning the wealth before you pass away, before you, um, you know, leave it in your will. And, and so things like even giving to charity, um, giving gifts to your children while you're alive, is that a good idea? Um, how much of it would you do? I mean, does this come into these conversations and what's your advice on that? I know some families, when their children are as young as five, they give them, you know, they give them $10, they give them $50 and they, and they, but they coach it and they say, you should leave, you know, a certain amount of money for charity and you should save some and you should invest some and you should, then you can spend some, but that's the last piece. Like we've forgotten to teach our kids about these, you know, timeless, timeless lessons about wealth creation. And also teaching our kids to take risks. We, we, when we are transitioning wealth to our children, we're not saying, now it's very important you go out and buy a five-year GIC that's yielding you know, 0.5%. We're like, you take that and if you do some research and you believe in something profoundly, you take a big swing for the fence. Because you're young 
and you can afford to take risks, but we don't want to create that next generation who is so cautious and careful that they have no confidence and understand that you, there is no way you can beat the street or beat the market by being afraid of taking risks. That is going right back to my great grandfather and entire distribution business, grandfather chemicals, plastics and my, my father's industry, publishing. We have all done it because we believed in something, wanted to do something, but we always took risks. Measured, listen, if all we do is create wealth and then die and leave it to our two children, and we don't pass those values of entrepreneurship and risk-taking, they have two children, it's gone, it's consumed. We actually have to take risks in order to create wealth that grows faster than our own progeny. It's simple math. That's interesting. I, I, I think back to uh, my childhood and as I was going to university and some piece of land came up for sale and, and I wanted to buy this land because it was right next to my parents' farm and all those kinds of things. And my dad at that point just said, you know, that's just far too risky. You know, I, that, that land has sold four times. Everybody has doubled their money. And you've been, we can always look backwards, right? We should have, we could have, or whatever it happens to be. But that risk portfolio is very different as we get older, right? As we get older, our, my perception of risk uh, is very different than somebody that's 20, 25, 30 years old. And uh, it's uh, to remind ourselves of, of what that next generation of your friends are feeling like and whether that's really risky or not. They may think that this is just a, a zero risk situation. Tom, uh, a question about in your planning deal, um, when, you're, when you're planning, have you had your advisors, I think we maybe touched on this, but just quickly, um, who are the advisors that you have included in your plan as you're planning your estate? Yeah, it's our, it's our wealth advisor, it's our, it's our accountant, and it's our lawyer. Yeah, all, okay. all three, it's the three pillars. And uh, oh my goodness, when you have your advisors talking amongst themselves without us having to say, yeah, well, thank you, accountant. We'll, we'll make sure that we pass that on to our lawyer. It's like, it was just passed on to our lawyer. Like they're there. Right. It just is so efficient. The clarity, the, the, as opposed to that siloed approach. I mean, really what I'm describing is a, is a version of the multifamily office or a family office, but we despite our wealth or levels of wealth, we're all capable of doing this. And the cost is, uh, is, is relatively, I mean, it, well, it's tiny compared to a family that goes off the rails and lawyers up. It's, it's just, in fact, it's, it's embarrassing. The cost that is imposed on a family because they didn't spend $500 or $1,000 or $3,000 on a will power of attorney and healthcare directive who ends up costing families hundreds of thousands of dollars in extra taxes. Uh, the, average, the average estate litigator won't even take on a retainer. That is a family member who wants to sue their brother or sister. They won't even open up a retainer for less than $15,000. Average court costs running upwards of 12, 13, $14,000 a day. The average family estate trial going two weeks. Do the math. Compare that to a family meeting where someone is paying some advisors a couple of thousand dollars for a couple of hours, uh, minute taking, nice and tidy, nice and clean, a day that everyone can look forward to. I, I can tell you, I don't know a single family that, that, that doesn't meet. After the family meeting, they go and they have a dinner. They go and have a, they have a meal and they celebrate how smart they are. Um, and, and seldom are the advisors invited to that. That's where family go and give themselves a pat on the back and say, that, this has not been easy, um, but you know what? We're getting through this. We are actually making really great progress. Yeah. And here's, my, here's one of my final remarks, Bob. When people die, you know, what, you know what children remember? They remember the family meetings. They remembered how, how much effort their parents put in to make sure that the family worked well when they were gone. That is the gift. It's not the money. How we transition our wealth is more important than what we leave. 
Thank you. Uh, just to make sure that to we round out uh, item number six of the uh, the uh, planning ideas, and that is about governance. Any quick comments about governance? I'm hoping that, yeah, that, that writing a fancy, writing a yeah. vision statement is is not one of my favorite things to do, but uh, creating that vision statement amongst the family might be pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm literally I'm just going to think off the top of my head. A, a good family mission statement could be. Um, we want to work as a family using our surplus capital to build trust and mutual respect. Our dream is that our, any inherited wealth will release potential in the next generation. That's it. So let's get started. Um, right. And that's how a family meeting can start. And oh, but before we do that, I just want to emphasize that confidentially, confidentiality is important in this family meeting. Whatever happens and is said in this room with our advisors present will stay here. And everyone acknowledges that. That clears the way for people to behave, to speak reasonably and responsibly. And let's not forget the obvious. Bob, we are talking about the division of surplus wealth. Nice problem to have. <laughs> there are many, many other problems that should be weighing people down. This is this should not be one of them. Right, right. So, Tom, the to-do list, uh, our action, our call to action. One or two things that everybody on this call, including Bob, should do or resolve to do uh, before we go to sleep tonight. <sighs> two things. Um, if you haven't completed the Willing Wisdom Index, that checklist. It's, listen, it's eight minutes and it is truly confidential, not kind of confidential, it's truly confidential. No last name required. Enter your first name, make up a screen name. No one, when I say no one cares, people care about you. I'm just saying that no one is judging you. You shared your score, <laughs> it, but we know from this tool that takes eight minutes that if you answer the questions honestly, the algorithm is going to give you incredible recommendations, really clear recommendations to help you start a family meeting, make major decisions about your will, power of attorney and healthcare directive, so that when you go visit your lawyer, it's not a three hour meeting, it's a 30 minute meeting. And Bob, we all know, that 30 minute meetings don't cost as much as three hour meetings. And so you're gonna save money and have a better estate plan. So it's a great, it's a great gift that you're sharing with your clients. Oh, thank you for that. And uh, just a reminder everybody that uh, as we wrap this up, uh, the, the, the two books, uh, they're, they're called Every Family's Business and Willing Wisdom. Uh, if you go to our website, you can request a copy of the books. We're sending these books out for free. And the, the Willing Wisdom Index is also available on our, on our website. Uh, if you go through our website, it is for free. If you went to Tom's website, you just have to pay, I don't know, a couple hundred bucks, I think. So that's our gift to you. Uh, complete the index um, and, and use it uh, and use the checklist. Uh, join me in my desire to improve my, my score. I truly, uh, I'm going to talk to Tom once we're done this and if he's already agreed to talk to me, et cetera, about how we follow up with everybody. But I wanna be able to increase my score by 25 points in, in 12 months. Uh, that's gonna be that I have a, a lot of work to do and uh, that checklist comes right out in the action plan, right in the front of the index uh, report. Um, uh, just a reminder, uh, this is being recorded. Please uh, share this with your friends and business colleagues. Um, the more we get this message out, the better it all is. And I think, uh, uh, you know, from uh, learning and from our client's point of view, the more we share this news and, and uh, the, the, how well the books are written. Everybody that I've given a copy of the book to enjoys the books. They're easy to read. They're profound. They're simple, but they've got some profound messages in them. And the more you read them, the more you realize that perhaps this is just a bit more, uh, there's more to this than... Uh, uh, meets the eye. So, uh, Tom, I'm, I'm going to, uh, oh, just one quick thing. I want to thank uh, my panelists. I want to thank my production crew here at the office for all that they've done to make this possible and makes this look so easy. But trust me, there's a lot of work that goes in the background to making this possible. So thank you, everybody, for being, uh, to, for doing your part. Tom, so, so I can leave the last words for you. And then I've got one of the quotes from your book that I'm going to just close on. But 
Uh, any last words, Tom? Yeah, it would be simply this. Um, read the book. Don't wait for the movie. <laughs> and thank you, Bob. I, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed these three conversations. We've covered a lot of ground and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, and, and a couple of quotes from Tom and, and his book. Uh, he says that, remember that when you will with wisdom, it is wisdom that you will. So that's right out of Tom's book. And and I hope that these series have uh, helped you turn chaos into calmness and that uh, may your transition between your family groups and your friend groups uh, be even more successful. Thank you, everybody, for being part of this. And uh, we'll chat soon. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Bye-bye.